Hello everybody, welcome back to the Tone Aries podcast. Before we get into it there, we just want to remind people that you know, we're supported through Danny Donovan at quickminutes.com. Mm. Yeah, Danny's a, a very good friend of both myself and James. He comes from the north side as well and he grew up locally and, <clears throat> you know, he's a, been a massive supporter of the podcast and both myself and James since we actually began and, you know, he's uh, he has his own company called Quick Minutes now and and quickminutes.com is a meeting management application for um, semi-formal and formal meetings. And look, if you want to know more about that, quickminutes.com and supporting Danny, supporting us. Um, so if you're interested in that, check them out and enjoy the rest of the podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Two Narrows podcast. I'm your host, James, and I'm joined as always by my good friend, Timmy Long. Hi, everyone. Rory Horn, the academic in Maynooth University. You've got a book out at the moment called Gaffs. And you're a wealth of knowledge of anything related to the housing crisis at the moment. You're the go-to person for the media. And you've been on a lot of... Um, you did a live with Blind Boy on Vicar Street last week. I did indeed. Yeah, yeah. so we might talk about that. You've been on RT and Virgin Media and all these very recently. So we're delighted to have you here. And you're also a friend of the Tarta Shack. You have your own podcast, Reboot Republic. I do indeed, yeah. And I'm delighted to be here. And yeah, no, and this will be posted on that too. It will indeed. It will be on Reboot Republic as well, people. Yeah, so hi to well. all the Reboot Republic yeah. people. And uh, check us out on Tone Ari's podcast. But before we get into all the housing stuff, we'll just get to know you first. So for the people that don't know you, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us about where you're from, what it was like growing up. Yeah, I, I, I come from Tremor originally um, in County Waterford. People lovely might, little town. Lovely little village. Uh, not so small anymore, mm. but it was quite small when I was growing up. Um, a great little spot. And um, we used to, I was joking, looking at the river out there, we used to come, so we're very close to Pork and Cueve here. I used to come down here every summer with the dad to watch Waterford and Cork hurlers beat the crap out of each other. Um, Our Cork beat the crap out of Waterford. I it? think now it was until the mid-1990s <laughs> then Waterford started doing it the other way around. Yeah. But uh, there were always great games and it was always great. But it was funny. It was the only time I ever got out of Waterford, really. Mm. <laughs> you know who was a fantastic player? And to, he, he was like Dermot O'Sullivan. Remember Dermot John O'Sullivan? Milan. John Milan. I yeah. love me County. What a tough, tough player I, I, Dan, I Dan Shanahan that. that whole team yeah. they were tough bastards Ken they? McGrath yeah. they were they were really were they were an amazing team amazing and Milan of course was you know he was a, a great character and still is you know yeah. great and and the, the passion that was you know for Herlin was so strong you know and it's interesting when you you know things that drive us you know Herlin was a great driver for me and a great connection with my dad um, who actually unfortunately passed away here in Cork um, in Cork Hospital uh, a brain tumor when um, I was just 21 cool. which was a very hard time for me mm-hmm. um but yeah growing up was was interesting I, I we lived for the first 10 or 11 years of my life in uh, private rental actually housing it wasn't it was unusual at the time but my parents had emigrated to Canada is you know is Tremor like a, a town like y'all where you'd have some holiday homes and some social housing or like what's the social context of Tremor yeah, Tremor is an interesting place. Tremor would, it would have had always some level of um, holiday homes down by the beach and there's the amusements people are probably, uh, yeah. the Marys they call them, a uh, great spot. But it, it's a town that grew a lot in the 1990s um, and expanded. As, you know, and my parents would have been that generation who kind of moved into Tremor, uh, not originally from there. Um my dad was from a place called Ballygunner um, in Waterford and my mum was from Leash. Um, my mum was a nurse. My dad was a, he was actually a, an architectural draftsman, um, which is a person who draws the pictures, draws the pictures, mm. <laughs> the uh, designs, the houses for, for architects. And he worked as a foreman on building sites in Canada. But he came, they came back. And Tremor, you're asking about the social context. Yeah, there's there's um, social housing in Tremor. There's, you know, a mix of private housing. So it's quite a mixed town. It's quite, it was, when I was growing up, it was a mixed community, you know, and a very, um, you know, people from all different backgrounds together going to school and that. Um, but yeah, we were in private rental, which would have been unusual enough. Um, and I remember the, uh, you know, I do talk about this when I talk about the housing crisis that, it's not something that's just academic to me. It's something that is, kind of, I think, deeply, uh, I understand and means something to me, the necessity of having a secure home mm. as a base. Um, and we had issues with the landlords. You know, the, the landlord was, you know, 
whatever, you know, but I, I always remember walking up to the, the big house of the landlord across the town and, you know, just that sense as a young child going, you know, just you feel the kind of power imbalance, you know, and, and uh, contrast that with myself and Timmy's upbringing, even though we had our challenges, we lived in a council house. So the, this, the living situation wasn't precarious, you know. Yeah. Like we, we we never felt like we were going to be evicted anytime soon. Yeah. The rent was always affordable, you know. So it's a bit di big mm. difference there. And like, where would we be without council houses, you know? I think a lot of the emphasis back there then as well, back in them times, was just housing people. It wasn't really about the rental income for the corporations back then. It was more about making sure everybody had somewhere to live. The social side of it. Yeah. 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 No, you're absolutely right. You know, back, like that was probably, you know, that was the 1980s and into the 1990s. And that was probably at the point, it was at the point when we had the huge expansion of home ownership and that actually councils were stopping at that point, the building. Um, and councils weren't stopping. Councils were told by government to stop building. And they started that whole, I kind of, in the housing context, I trace the crisis that we're in today back to then because that was when the thing the whole idea that everybody should own their home and that council housing was a bad way of living you know they started that whole stigmatization mm. of council housing which came of course from england you know the thatcher yeah. attacking council housing that people who lived in council housing were delinquents and this whole ideology really warped ideology um and you see then, you know, the, the, the decline of social housing and they st stopped investing in it. And of course, then when you don't maintain them, mm. you know, things go down. And um, yeah, that's kind of where I see the, the roots of the crisis in many ways. Did you ever come across uh, Ruth Levitas? She's no. an English academic, but uh, she writes about uh, a model of social exclusion, you know, and different discourses to describe social exclusion. But one of them is the moral underclass discourse. And people like ourselves mm. would be labelled as leeches or, you know, um, we won't go work because of lazy attitudes and stuff like that, you know. But it's all kind of tied in with the Thatcher and then the new Labour that came afterwards, you know. That kind of era where there is a real stigma towards people accessing social benefits, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's something that... Um, because a lot of people ask me all the time, you know, what? Um, and, and there's something as well I talk about my past later on when we talk about homelessness and trauma, because, you know, I did experience trauma in my own childhood as well. Um, you know, in terms of sexual abuse and that and that sort of, I think, gives me something as well as a connection with understanding trauma, you know, and a connection with people, because I think part of the problem with a lot of academia and policy is there's often a disconnect with the, the people, mm. with the humans, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, the that, humanity. That makes that, so much sense. And whereas for me, I come at this, you know, from, you know, understanding, as I said, trauma, but also understanding housing insecurity. But I was loved in my home. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely in my home. My what, abuse was from family from outside. Member? No, okay. no, it was from outside. It was a person who lived in the community. Um, what age you, Rory? I was in a room. 13 14 you know um and uh, did it go on for long not very long no no it was it was a, a man who was grooming us as a group yeah um you know mm. and uh you know what happened a number of times and we actually in the end um a number of us uh went to the guards over it years later when i was about 30 and uh we got him sent he was sentenced and uh he was convicted um and yeah i was just going to ask you yeah. i was going to ask you um was it something you spoke about before for us obviously something you spoke about before because i was saying i was thinking in my own head i was saying is he okay i don't know because i didn't realize that it was something that had been out in the media already no no i haven't really spoken about it public much yeah. but i'm very yeah. conscious you know in your podcast you know you talk about yeah. you know this the whole yeah. you know you talk about abuse about trauma about addiction and I felt it was a space, you know, to talk about it in a way, because I think it does, you know, these experiences, because people wonder, you know, why am I so, you know, often, you know, not just passionate, but committed around, mm. you know, housing and inequality. And, you know, I think you have to explain the person behind that, that there are things that motivate us and that make us who we are, you know, and form yeah. us and and. It's just something I think about, you know, and... Did you ever come across um, Poverty Safari? 
book by Darren McGarvey, Scottish rapper. Yes, I've brilliant. heard that one. Yeah, brilliant book. But he talks about, uh, you know, like if 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 the media are reporting on a child abuse case, they use a kind of a stock image of a child, maybe covering their face, sitting on the stairs, maybe with a teddy bear, you know, a real kind of sad image. But he's like, if you show the, the the picture of the child sitting on the stairs looking sad, and then in the next report you show the juvenile delinquent joyriding in Cherry Orchard. And then in the next image you show a fella coming out of court covering his face. That's the same person. Same in child. In different parts of yeah. their lives, do you know what I mean? Yeah. The same child, it's, yeah. It, 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 when they, like, so the, f the homeless shelters and prisons are filled with traumatised children. Yeah, yeah. That's the and, and, and that is, you know, again, part of why I was talking about that is because when I come at all this, I see the, and try to see the humanity, you know, in people. And because I think what ha what's happened so much in our, government policy um, particularly towards you know disadvantaged communities but in homelessness as well you see it it's this assumption that there's something wrong with the person you know they're blamed themselves and, and we hear this from the very top you know from the Taunishta, um you know senior members in councils who are responsible for dealing with homeless they say ah you know people are homeless because you know they're something they've done you know this idea that they have done something wrong and remember back in the day when the progressive democrats were in government michael mcdowell was the the part was the minister for justice and he made a comment which was very telling he says a certain level of inequality is normal for any society yeah it's like no we don't have to do anything about it this is yeah. normal but that's yeah. grand for him to say and he's living in his mansion <laughs> do you know what i mean you're collecting yeah. your social welfare with four kids you know what's normal yeah. do you know what i mean yeah. but that's the type of attitude yeah. you're dealing with like yeah and well, he, he actually said he said that it was a important motivation motivatory <laughs> factor he went on like a, i actually quote that his quote in my book because i, I remember you know looking back over it and going just by struck by like what way of thinking know, you must yeah. think about the world yeah to look at it and go poverty is actually necessary mm. we need poverty we need homelessness to keep people motivated mm. do, do you know wouldn't you like to just swap things around for somebody like I him know. and put him into the position of growing up in the social housing estate with mm. the single parent massive amounts of mental health and poverty See, we, we, we had a talk the other day, myself and James, right, and we were talking about that, mm. where we grew up, yeah. you know, and, and if you grew up in a different family in a different area, how different your whole life could yeah. be. And that is the black and white of it. The black and white is, if I grew out, if I grew up in this area here with this mother and father, instead of where I grew up here with this mother, our father, how different things could be. But you know what? I often think then to myself, I wouldn't change a thing. Mm -hmm. You know why? Yeah, go on. You know why? Because the awareness that we have today because of the lived experience of mm -hmm. the lives we lived. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and not the just empathy that, and compassion you can there bring. You go. The but you know what it, it would be mm. you know what it would be good for the likes of him and Leo and them just to like for one week they're on hap, right? They're on hap. <laughs> They're on a precarious contract. They're a paycheck away from becoming homeless. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That's the and that insecurity and that fear and stress people live under is huge. Like mm. so, you're on and people might look and say, "Oh, sure, they're getting the hap and they're getting the social welfare and they're getting the children's loans," but they're still not making ends meet. They're still stressed all the time, and that stress is passed on to the children, and it's just a mess. But yeah, people like it, it. It is, you know, and you, you're right about that compassion. And that empathy, that it's it's absent, mm. and and I've really come to this position, because uh, you know people are asking me, and I was referring to it earlier all the time, like why are we here? Like how did we get to here? How did politicians allow it? How did governments allow it? How did the state allow it get to the point where you've the highest ever number of homeless people in the history of the state? And part of it is ideology. Part of it is, you know, they don't believe in the state. They don't believe in the state building social housing. Part of it is the the blaming of the individuals. And and then if you follow that on, it does lead you to come to a conclusion that they actually don't care. Mm. They actually don't care, which is a really, uh, you know, it challenges a lot of that idea, people's assumption that actually they care. Some of them don't care. They actually don't. And it's really problematic when you have people in power who don't care 
about people in poverty or people in situations of housing insecurity are not even class wise in terms of the younger generation. When we look at an entire generation, no matter what class they're from, mm. can't get a home of their own, you know, are stuck renting, paying rents that will mean they'll be forever in a situation of housing insecurity in a way um, and not be able to get on with their lives that, you know, they, they, there's this huge lack of care. You know, a lack of compassion that you're talking about um, in our government, in our politics, in our state. And I think it's it's something that, you know, that idea of them going out and experiencing it, I think that's something very real that, you know, I've done research with some of the homeless homeless families, with homeless families, and, you know, sitting down and spending time with them and, and talking to them. And, you know, when you spend time and you see the situations they're in, the experience of the children, the trauma, you know, it gives you a very different view than just been stuck in a place where I think what happens with government is they do become disconnected, mm. utterly disconnected mm. from the reality of people's lives. Because mm. you go, how else could they make the decisions they're making? I you know. Yeah, it's um, when we were speaking there was something popped into my head around. Maybe see these ministers that, that have the power around the housing crisis and everything else and budgets and everything else in this country put one of them into a home in Holly Hill or Ardcullen or wherever for a week and leave them live like the people that live there and mm. see how it actually is. Yeah. You know, these people, it's not like they want to be this way, you know. Some some people are sick. Some people may have mental health issues. A lot of them might have no education, you know, and, and they might have jobs then that just keep the family afloat as James says for that week mm. maybe two weeks if they're not in work then for the third week or whatever or they're always sick and they've no income it goes pear shaped I have a question in relation to the housing in this mm. country what country in this planet okay Europe wherever has a housing system that works very very adequately and is there such is there such country that has a housing system where everybody's housed there's no problems around housing there's no problems with the rises of costs of living you know and around Rent housing and, and all this has any country got a system like that recognized or anything yeah there are um the one is called ireland and it was like it in the 1960s, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> 1970s, yeah, well, yeah. you know, and, and I think it's really important that we do say that, mm -hmm. you know, we had one of the best housing systems in Europe. We were commended by the United Nations in the 1960s and 70s for the uh, the way in which we rolled out council housing. You know, we built it for people. We've done this in the past. This this did exist. It all went wrong, as I said, in the 1990s, really, in 1980s, when councils were basically the government just told them you're no longer building social housing. Everything's going to come now from everyone will own their home. And if you don't want it, but I'll, I'll come back to you. Why did that happen? Why did it happen? It, Why did government is, this, give that power? Yeah, away? that's a really good question and really important because I was thinking as well when we were talking there about government ministers and that. Mm. It's not just about their ideology. It's not just about their lack of care. It's also a thing called interests, which is in whose interests is all this happening? And it does come to the private developers, yeah. increasingly the investor funds, the landlords, those who own the properties, who make the profit from housing, the landowners, those who've really, really profited from housing. They're the ones who've been influencing policy. So it's not just that, you know, the government don't care. They also, they, they're thinking we're making policy so that these guys will deliver the housing because they're the ones who can do it. And they're the ones who are making the big money from it. And, you know, why did it happen? It would happen exactly that. The private developers, the builder, you know, builders less so, you know, small builders. But you talk about developers, big developers who own land, who, you know, access finance, who, you know, hire in the builders to do it. Um, you know, I won't mention names here, but we all know them. You know, they crashed the, the economy back in, you know, in the Celtic Tiger. But they're the ones who were really influential. And, and government essentially said, you know, well, they'll now deliver housing. That's where it'll come from. It'll come from the, the developers and they make their big money. And that's what happened during the Celtic Tiger. You know, house prices went through the roof. Yeah. Um, and what happened as well at that point was people started buying multiple properties. 
So banks were throwing money at, at ordinary people and saying, you know, if you own your house, you know, you can borrow more and you can become a landlord. This was kind of in the 2000s now, early 2000s. You had the start of what I call the turning of housing from home into an asset, into an investment, mm -hmm. something you make money from and people make more and more money from. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, you know, in the Celtic Tiger, the last three or four years of the Celtic Tiger, really interesting figure. We were building about 80,000 to 90,000 homes in one year. And if you think this year, we're probably going to build about 20,000. But half of those homes that were built were been bought by someone who already had a property. They were buying them as an investment asset. Right. And of course, that put huge pressure pushing up house prices, but also then meant that was the start of generation rent. Because you had young people in the 2004, 2005, they were trying to buy a home. But then you had these other people who were, you know, people who had money were buying a property. They could pay more. So they were locking out this generation from being able to buy. So that was the start of when, you know, property became this investment asset. Then we had the crash. And in the crash then, it was basically they, you know, I go into... They set up NAMA after that, which was the National Asset Management Agency. They mm. put all the loans and from the banks and the land into that. And government said, you know, you know, utterly just they, they what they said then was rather than using all this land we have now, all this you know, they, NAMA actually had 10,000 apartments at one point oh, rather wow. than using that to say we're now going <laughs> to ensure Ireland has affordable homes into forever the future they said we'll get the investor funds came knocking and said you know what's happening now there's this massive crash we're going around everywhere buying up all the property land we can do the same for you and sort out your problem so the vulture funds came in bought it all and now they're the ones who have the land who are building the you know all the built to rent apartments and yeah. the government just abandoned it abandoned housing abandoned um social housing as well of course like true you look at the austerity years, you know, all those cuts that happened yeah. from kind of 2010 onwards, the huge cuts to communities, social housing, the building of social housing was the area that was cut the most. Now, why did they cut social housing the most out of any other area? The least profitable. Least profitable. But it was also ideology. Yeah. It was their belief. They didn't value social housing. The state shouldn't interfere or something like yeah, that. Yeah, see, but they, did, they didn't place no value on social housing. Mm. And they said, and the other thing was, they changed then to HAP. So in 2014, they introduced the housing assistance payment yeah. and called that social housing. It's yeah. not social housing. And, and, and that, of course, bailed out the landlords who had gone into arrears yeah, yeah. because the property price crashed. Yeah. Look at the, the population of Ireland and uh, the amount of households we have here. I live in one house with my family. Yeah. We rent it. That's our home. Okay? Yeah. I don't have a rental property or anything like that. James is the same. He yeah. has his own home. Yeah. Home. I have my own home, home as well. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm just> how, <laughs> how many properties are actual rental properties within today's market? What percentage? So if in terms of the properties, there's about 20% of our total houses, 20%, so about a fifth, are private rental properties now. Okay. A fifth. So you're talking about a million people Okay. Are now living. And the big change was in the 1990s, that was only about 10%. So we've had a doubling of the amount of people who are living in the private rental sector. So, like, that's just, you know, huge. And it's, it's a big business today. It's a big business. You know, and it's it's whoever paid the highest rent today than whoever needs it. Yeah. You know, who, who mostly needs it. And and in the past, in the, in the 60s and 70s and, you know, into the 80s, if you had a housing need, so you were, you know, your income meant you couldn't buy a house, the government, you would go qualify for social housing and you would get a council house. Mm. But now, if your income isn't enough to be able to afford either the rent or a mortgage, you're given HAP mm. and told, go find somewhere in the private rental sector. Mm. And what it means is you have landlords get to decide whether you get social housing or not. Mm. Private landlords. And so we see then the most excluded, the most stigmatized, the most discriminated against, be they traveler, lone parent, single man, whatever it is, young person. The landlord goes, don't like the look of you, mm -hmm. you know. So then you have 
where are they going? And even if you are lucky enough to get a HAP apartment, you're only six months away. You're only ever six months away from becoming homeless anyway. Because they can just, uh, I'm selling, yeah. or I'm renovating. That's the contract on the HAP payment. I think, I think they, they can't evict six you months. with a, a six months notice or something. Well, the HAP payment will go on, but the problem is if the landlord decides I'm selling up, then you're out just as anybody else. And can they do that in other countries? Or is it no. more, is this more secure in other countries? Yeah, much more secure. And that's the, you know, the question mm. you were asking earlier about what country does it right. Most European countries, it, it, like it's, they're just baffled at the idea in Ireland, that a land that a tenant can be paying their rent, do nothing wrong, and a landlord can evict them just because they're selling the property. That doesn't exist. Yeah. You know, people have lifetime security. If you're paying the rent, it's your home. Whereas here it's that problem. Landlords still see it. This is my investment asset. And I heard them on the radio the other day, like I was just going <laughs> the landlord's representative was saying that uh, the problem why all the landlords are leaving, because I don't know if you heard, oh, yeah, it's all this talk, landlords are leaving, yeah. and we have to try to figure out how do we stop all the landlords leaving. <laughs> and he was like, he goes, um, you know, the problem is the rent controls. And the rent controls means landlords can't charge the market rent, so they're getting out. And the interviewer said, so what do you want them to do? And he wouldn't follow on. Well, what's the logical conclu conclusion of what they want? They want to get rid of rent caps so landlords can charge whatever they want. <laughs> so you're going to you know landlords can charge whatever they want you'll be thrown talking about hundreds of thousands of people into homelessness because they can't afford mm -hmm. you know what the market rent is which is whatever it is you know it's two and a half grand a month in Dublin whatever it is down here in Cork yeah. you know people can't afford what's been charged so the landlord's solution is get rid of the rent caps and allow us charge whatever mm -hmm. we want and you're going like what sort of mindset is that to because they look at it as a business but housing can't be a business yeah you know, people's home is a fundamental basic need. And I know, you know, you talk a lot about mental health and psychology. And I write a lot about this in my book about kind of the philosophy of home and the psychology of home and its mm. social purpose and its purpose to us is, you know, you can't do anything if you don't have a home. No. Like you can't children, you can't have children. You can't be yourself if you don't have somewhere to go throw your feet up and not be worried about, you know, you talked about stress. Like the stress that people are under, you know, worrying about, is the landlord going to evict me? Where am I going to cover the rent from? And that's like, it's, and then young people as well, you know, stuck at home. And you were talking about it before the, um, you know, there's now this generation who are living at home with their parents, you know, mm. overcrowding, going, I can't, yeah, like my parents still are asking me, you know, I'm 35 and they're saying to me, did you brush your teeth? Did you? Yeah, <laughs> you I know. know. <laughs> did you, you know, text me when you're, what, you know, when you're out. And you're Is going, that your plate down there in the <laughs> sink? <laughs> Get home and wash it. <laughs> exactly, you know. Are they your shoes stinking out the yeah. cupboard, you know? <laughs> or even, What's if, the, even if you're are like. Are these your jocks here, are they? What? <laughs> even if they're are like. Are ones that jocks? Yeah, yeah, who else? <laughs> exactly. If something happens with your wife or something, even if there's marital breakdown. Like you could go mm -hmm. before, you could go away and rent your apartment. But yeah. now people are going back home, and mm -hmm. and even if they're not married and they're single, like they're in their thirties, they might have kids. The grandparents are there. To, sometimes there's four generations under the one household. Yeah. And you know what I find where we're from, is that the city council is the blame, right? That's what I'm not saying. That's the truth, but I think that's the perception because people rely traditionally like what you're talking about rely on the corporation mm. or the city council to provide mm. the housing mm. i know we have people on waiting lists for over 10 years mm. and they're crowded in on top of each other and the city council are like they're, they're, they're getting nowhere with the city council they're bidding on the cbl you go on the cbl there might be two properties and you'll see four thousand bids on it you know what i mean yeah. this and is the choice based letting where yeah they, where what's available in terms of on the council housing is put up there and people yeah. try then see can i get that and which is an impossible like it's a, it's a lottery it's yeah. literally a lottery but what i see then is that um that frustration and i try to understand anti-social behavior for young people you know mm. so i think like if a young person is in a, his kitchen and is stressing the home and they're talking about we entered the council today we entered the local td the local councillor housing this housing that he's getting all that negative information around the council and the government and all that that's what drives apathy in elections and voting and that's what drives anti-social behavior because structures represent the government and the authority and that's why you know playgrounds get destroyed you know buildings get spray painted the windows get broken because it's just a venting of all that anger and frustration, you know? I, I completely agree. And yeah. I, I, 
I write about this again in, in the book. There's a number of levels you can look at. Like I, you know, you go from children in homelessness, for example, like there's tens of thousands, you know, it, it, we don't have the full figures, but you know, there's 3000 children today in emergency accommodation. Like what must they think their government thinks about them? Mm. You know, and obviously some of them are very young, but some of them are teenagers. I say, what was the, a teenager sitting in a in a B and B think of their country that you know we can't even get home and watching you know their little uh, uh, their horrific stories like yeah. you know their little brother or sister pulling the kettle down on themselves because the fucking place is tiny and mm -hmm. you know the Temple Street will talk about this in Dublin they talk about the presentations from homeless accommodation of young children with burns you know, all sorts of things. And, and not because of neglect, but literally the size of the place is so cramped. Um, and, you know, what must that young person think? And similarly in the estate where, in you know, in housing we're overcrowding because, you know, that, that person in his, you know, late, mid-twenties going, oh, what, what does this country care about me? You know, what, what does what does the government care about me? And and the, the, what, what is called the neoliberal ideology or the, the ideology of the market you know and I, often people can connect with it when you talk about margaret thatcher you know that thinking of there is no such thing as society there is only individuals and you all work hard and you'll get then what you deserve and those who aren't successful it's because there's something wrong with them or something and they the did. state doesn't intervene to help the state doesn't intervene to help and shouldn't intervene to help and if the state does intervene it just creates laziness and delinquency and mm. the problem is that people do have an expectation that they'll get a council house and that's the problem and you go that that's the, the the right wing ideology the neoliberal ideology that when you you know pair it back that's what our government actually thinks mm. because i was sat at a um a launch of a housing policy document in 2011 11 years ago when a department of housing official was standing saying we're now changing our housing policy we're no longer going to build the council estates because we've no money. The country's broken and it didn't work anyway. And we think that's that's that social housing should be seen as something temporary. So it's a bit like the dole. You get it for a while if you're in a, a situation of, you know, housing insecurity. Mm. But this idea of, you know, council housing, social housing for life, you know, we need to change that. And you're going, what a complete lack of understanding. Mm of how housing systems work, of the markets of inequality, and of the notion of, you know, the state should provide homes for people. And if you provide homes for people, you build communities. You know, you that's the whole point, that it can't be just seen as this, you know, and which is they saw, they saw the market will provide housing. The market will never provide sufficient housing. No. It would have long ago if it was going to. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And never provide secure housing, never provide affordable housing. And you build up communities. Like I worked in, in Dolphin House and Dolphin's Barn um, in Dublin's inner city for six or seven years from 2007, 2013. You know, a strong you know, a social housing estate, one of the biggest social housing estates in Dublin after Ballymun. And uh, huge, you know, deprivation, you know, the housing conditions were horrific, dampness, mould. Mm. But this community there was amazing. And it was why I stayed there so long. Like, the, you were, they just brought you in, you know. And I was working with them on a daily basis around their housing issues and supporting them and, and campaigning around the right to housing. But I always remember it's the, the community connection, the sense of community, the way people supported each other. And the value of actually having that housing, and, and that really gave me an insight into the importance of public housing, you know, why it's important. And, and we got it so wrong and policy is so wrong when it looks at it as something that is like a handout mm. rather than actually seeing public housing should be central mm. to what a government does and to what councils do. Yeah. My dad is from Inchicore, yeah. which isn't far. No, it's very close. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he grew up in a place called uh, Bullfin Gardens, which is is near St. Patrick's Athletic. Yeah. Yeah. Richmond Park. And uh, so they grew up in, st they're all kind of red brick kind of council houses. They're only small terraced houses. There's loads of them, you know. Um, the house where he grew up, just a few doors away, that was sold on daft that he recently went up for four odd and it sold for over 700 grand. In, in, in Ducor, and the gentrification of the area means that the people that 
actually another example of a Fatima which isn't far away mm-hmm. you know yeah so they're, re- they're recently evicting people out of the last tower block there and like so the people that grew up there all their lives they'll never be able to afford to move back there as yeah. soon as they're gone yeah and that's the sadness because they're all local authority areas but and that's where they were happy to put people when it suited them but now they want the land back because it's you know profitable because the city's expanding so let's demolish them or let's move them out you know and it's just a sense of injustice for the people that have a like it's not just a, a building or a road that's where they belong that's where like, their identity is that's where yeah. their mom is that's where they grew up and that's where all their friends are they had their communions they had their first kiss over there mm-hmm. just play football all that is being lost as well you know yeah that's happening everywhere yeah. up here at the moment i'd say jim yeah everywhere all over dublin anywhere where there's prime location and there's development um ability they're just knocking what's there and they're building just remember we were up in google and blocks and stuff. we were up in google headquarters a few weeks ago we emceed an event in a google dock building we we're up the top floor yeah you could see around the whole of dublin yeah but and Google own a lot of that Darkland area, they own all apartments and everything. But you could see some of the old houses, do you know? The yeah, old and the, they're just yeah, and, yeah they're su- and they're surrounded by big glass boxes, yeah, you know. Yeah. But it's like that small little bit of heritage is still there. But it's kind of sad to see the expanding of the expansion of the city around them. Mm. But like soon, do you know, they'll either die or they'll move on, and and all that will be lost as well. And and it's so important. The, what you talked about there about belonging and you know what I saw in Dolphin I saw myself in Tremor you know growing up in a small town the sense of community we had a really strong sense of community and sense of connection and I would always have a huge pride coming from Tremor you know it's where yeah. my family is from and um, you know I live in Dublin now but I live where you know in Fairview and I'm living there 10 years and you know built up connection with my neighbours and community as well and um. You know, actually live in a street where we have a mix, you know, the social housing, you know, there's people who own their home, there's renting. Um, and it's that that sense of belonging is actually something that Maslow talked about, you know, the Maslow hierarchy right. of needs. Yeah. That the sense of belonging, having feeling you belong somewhere and feeling a connection to a place is actually a human need. It's not just like something that's nice to have. Yeah. If we don't have that there's something wrong with us. Yeah. We feel something wrong and it impacts on your mental health. It impacts on your sense of self. And so that's another thing about this, you know, the, all that displacement. Um, and you can think of it even more, not just in terms of, again, social class and work class areas, but, you know, in middle class areas, you know, there's a whole generation now, young people who are going, we have to emigrate. I know. Because mm. we can't get a home. And how that must be like, it's bad enough ripped out of your community, but been displaced from your country. Mm. The sense, you know, and we we forced a generation to emigrate during the austerity years. We've a big audience from Australia and Canada, yeah. Irish people. Yeah. Are kind of in their their thirties and forties now. They left after the recession. Yeah. They've set a shop over there now. They're in you know thirties, forties, they have the mortgages and their kids and stuff like that. But they were literally forced out the door. Yeah. Because that there was no opportunities here for them. Yeah. And there's another generation yeah. facing that now. In terms well, of housing. You know, yeah. and that's but where where is the value in li- in life if you're if you're just going to work to pay for your rent or your mortgage? There's no, none. T- there's no value in no, life. No, no. It's like life shouldn't be about trying to figure out how are you covering the rent and the mortgage. Like, you know, it shouldn't be worrying every day how am I doing this. What happens if you have an accident yeah. in, in in the car or something on the way to work? A lot of people are afraid of getting sick what as well. What happens your mortgage? What happens to your rent? What if you have two kids and your wife is minding a six a six week old baby? You know that's that's where my head struggles to understand why why we're putting people into why we'd actually have this as a possibility of something that could happen mm-hmm. because you know and it is there and it's happening every day of the week mm-hmm. to different people and they're losing their homes like the last recession. What about all? The, how many different people took their own lives because of their homes being taken from? I heard of one man taking his life in Dublin in an apartment block because um, he thought that the life his his life insurance policy would would pay for the the mortgage and their home. You know, yeah. like yeah. that's the reality of of. But you know, in the height of that recession, the tracker mortgage scandal, there was people who were badly struggling, and then your banks adding an extra money 
and did, did, what they already couldn't pay. And there was people took their lives during that too, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. And 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 it's something like I I talk about this, you know, the mental health kind of Im- the, you know I call it the 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 damage that housing insecurity so many ways is affecting people um you know from that young people and not so young people people in their 30s and 40s who are still living at home with their parents feeling you know what what am i you know am i an adult am i you know in my 30s or 40s still having to live out of mommy and daddy if you're lucky enough um or people renting and, and going when am i ever going to have some security people some people you know and they contacted me and told you said to me you know that um you know, wanted to have kids but couldn't in terms of the insecurity of the rental sector and waiting and waiting and waiting until it got too late. Um, and you go, that's taking people's life dreams away from them. And, and it shouldn't be like yeah. this, as you're saying. Like, why should, um, like a home, like there, there's these basic things in a society that a country should guarantee as part of what we call a social contract. Like we go to work, we, you know, we do what we can, we contribute to society and there's in return government ensures you have a decent standard of living housing health education yeah you know they're basic things they're basic human rights like as a, as one of the wealthiest countries in the world like that should be what we do you know yeah. at a minimum mm-hmm. at a minimum for people do you know you say wealthiest countries in the world we've almost full employment at the moment do you know the economy has probably never been stronger do you know and there's uh, budget surpluses and everything but isn't there a disconnect between Ireland as an economy and Ireland as a society yeah. like what good is full employment and living in a rich country if people are can't afford to buy a home or can't even afford rent or can't even get rent get it, it, it people. some people can't even get an apartment yeah. even if they can afford rent I'm working with a lot of older people right so in my day job mm. I support older people to access social supports and stuff like that some of the older people, they, they, they use fossil fuels still because they might be in old homes. Yeah. But some people are 45 euro for a bag of coal. They're on 200 euros a week. Yeah. They're, they're not heating their homes half as much as they should be. What good is a booming economy when you have people living like that and you have children being reared in, in hotel rooms and not ab- able to bring friends back and for birthday pay? All that stuff we're losing out on, you know? There's a disconnect between Ireland as a society and as an economy. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I, th- I think that... You know, it's you have to quit. Like again, it's it's like, what's the purpose of all this? You know, you were asking. Yeah, you know, what's yeah. the point? What's the purpose? Just going to work to cover the rent. You know, like as a country, as a republic. You know, what's set out in our proclamation and all that. You know, you know, we do. We believe in that. We believe. Mm. You know, we're a country that, you know, supports people, cares about people. It's a great place to live in so many ways. You know, with mm. community and connection, and you know, they, they just everything the bit of crack the whole lot what we are you know we are something in this country and there's something you know that we feel is makes us you know why we just don't leave the country we feel connected you know there's yeah. there's amazing things about this country you know and yeah. and its people are at its core but you're right there is something deeply broken i would argue about mm. the country deeply broken when there is such a disconnect from the economy out here and even people in the Google jobs and people in you know, the construction sector, the building, you know, sector or, you know, well-paying jobs can't get a house and or, or, you know, fall sick or, you know, something like that can't access health care. And, you know, we talk about disability as well. Disability is a major issue in housing as well, you mm-hmm. know, and, and people with disabilities who who are forced to be in, living in situations completely inappropriate. And mm-hmm. you go, there is the point of an economy should be to ensure that you have a functioning society Mm. a society where everyone can to use that word flourish to be what they want to be to do what they want to do and i believe you know everyone most people are good and want to contribute and want to you know live the best life they can live and with meaning and purpose and that should be the function of the economy but we still have it wrong it's still not right in this country where you know we don't have these basic things like housing and health and supports. And it's it's like the, the it's still, as I said, housing and health as well is still seen as a business mm. by a lot of people. Or not a lot of people, some people who are in positions of power mm. within these sectors. What is the answer to a ho- housing yeah, I'm just crisis? about to ask that. If I was the yeah. minister for housing, 
I knew what my advisor, mm. what would you be advising well, me at the yeah. moment? Yeah, I, I think th there's lots we can do. And I think that's the, the Before thing. Before you say that, yeah. have you ever asked to be in a position like that by anybody? Because yeah. it, it, because I can't understand why somebody with your expertise and your knowledge isn't isn't being asked by the government, the Taoiseach, the Tanishta, to be able to set up a strategy going forward where we can solve all these different problems that we're having with housing um, in Just every the difference area. difference in ideologies. They don't believe the state should intervene, whereas Rory does. Yeah, that's 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 the crux of it. Isn't How it? do we change that? It going, is going back to the, yeah, the, yeah. It is definitely part of the, part of the problem that like, I did a report with um a colleague of mine in Minute, Mary Murphy, in two thousand and seventeen. So it's five years ago, where we were highlighting the problems with the housing assistance payment and the need to build social housing rather than getting it through the private rental market because it's so insecure and it's creating homelessness and also the need to introduce a time limit on the amount of time that a family and children were in emergency accommodation like we said it should no longer it should be no longer than six weeks mm. but yet we have children and families in emergency accommodation for up to two years and longer mm. you know think of what that does to a child and the parents you know the trauma and the cost of it and the cost of it absolutely as well how many houses would you buy out of the cost of that <laughs> oh, yeah. but that that is exactly it as well the amount of money we put into emergency accommodation that's going to private providers and because it's crisis response but <laughs> that report was brought up in the doll and actually some of the opposition parties fair play to them invited me in to present and i did present at the oroctus committees and um, i was invited in by the opposition parties not by yeah, the government. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but i presented it but the, the t-shock uh, leo varadkar and if i ever get to talk to him i'm sure we'll have a good laugh over it uh <laughs> said um when the reports they said i know that rory hearn guy he um he used to be involved in student unions in um in trinity and i met him one day at a uh, at a race in in the Phoenix Park, and he used language that you wouldn't expect from an academic. That was his response to an opposition TD asking, "Would he, yeah. you know, meet me and take?" And what had actually happened in the park that day, <laughs> in Phoenix Park, was we were at a race, and I saw him, and he was like minister for um, oh I can't remember tourism at the time, or it was 2013 around 2013. No, it was earlier, 2012, 2013 long time ago about four years before he said it but i was working in dolphin house at the time and seeing the the austerity cuts you know and the devastation mm. dolphin was supposed to get regenerated you know this rebuilding of social housing like in knocknahini knocknahini like the same and so this was back you know we were working on the regeneration plans and it was all about uh when the crash happened the council came out and told the community sorry there's going to be no regeneration until the market picks up again and you know whenever that was going to be mm. and, and people were devastated so i was working in that and seeing the poverty amongst children and all that from the cut so i went up to him and said you know you're an absolute disgrace i said you know you promised to burn the bondholders you didn't do it you know children deprivation is through the roof you know you're just a disgrace and he said uh, he just sort of looked at me and said mumbled something and i i just walked off that was our interaction and then subsequently he says on the floor of the doll that I more or less, you know. Mm, yeah. <laughs> he was just trying to undermine you. But I was going, what sort of person remembers such a small interaction I from know. years previous? But, yeah. uh, you know, bizarre one. But anyway, sure, I, you know, if I, I'll, I'll, be I'll, I'll be waiting. I'm waiting for the call from Leo and, and Dara. And So uh, for the record, are you yeah. a member of any political party? No, I'm not a member of any political party. You know, no. if uh, the opposition that invited you to the Oireachtas, if they got into power in the next general election, and you were offered an advisory role on the Department of Housing, would you take it? I'd have to consider it strongly, wouldn't I? It's, it's you know, you can't be talking about the need for change and then being offered opportunities to change it and have to go turn it. that turn yeah. that down, you know, 100%. I think. Um, but I'd be open to work with anyone if the government right now are willing to, to meet me and discuss the ideas, I would absolutely what kind be of changes? delighted to. So the changes that are needed, there are a number of things that could be done very, very quickly. Um, the first one is, you know, the eviction ban that they've just brought in yeah. until next March. Yeah. I think you extend that for three years at a minimum, right? So, because we're going to see a flood of evictions come next spring and summer if they don't do something about that. Mm. Um, that's an immediate thing. That would give people uh, relief. I would introduce legislation that would remove, 
the ability of a landlord to evict someone. And there's, you know, there's, there's and a few landlords just after turning off the podcast. <laughs> the <other laughs> <one>. oh, <yeah. laughs> I, I think it's, it's important as well to stay for people listening. But, but, you, yeah. you, if you're if you're not paying your rent and you're engaged in anti social okay, yeah, you uh, can still be evicted. Absolutely. Yeah. Aside from that, and no, and that should go through. Yeah, that's a very fair point. Yeah, yeah. No, and that should go through its due process. I'm yeah. talking about in sale of a property. Yeah. If you're uh, following the rules of your tenancy, then absolutely you should be able to stay there. For life, basically, and the minister did introduce a new measure where it allows that, but it's optional, which is the problem. You know what landlord is going to choose it? But yeah. I think there are lots of good landlords out there. We yeah. know as well there are lots of landlords who just and, and and part of it is trying to get the landlords to see it differently. You know, and maybe some of them just can't. Well, I know some of them just can't to see it like that is a tenant's home. You know, it's not just your property investment. It's their bloody home, and you have to understand that. What if someone turned around to you and said, I actually want, I'm going to sell your house out from underneath you. The bank turns around, you haven't paid off all your mortgage. I know you're paying it, you know, you've never missed a payment, but I actually want to sell it. So you've six months to get out. It's the same thing. They'd be uproar though. Can you imagine it? Mm. But is the problem then, some landlords aren't even in the country. It is. And some landlords are going around, and we know, you know, there's, there's examples as a example in Dublin at the moment anyway I, I won't go on more but people know about it like people have been evicted from apartments and you know the landlord's selling up because they see property prices have hit the height and so now they're starting to fall so they want to you know make the money um, but I, w- I would introduce that change I would um, I would put a load of money into the enforcement of regulations because we know that doesn't happen um, on landlords on Airbnb so that you would bring make sure that properties are even used for rental and actually stay as people's homes. Um, the other thing I would do is I would immediately tackle the vacancy and dereliction issue. Yeah. There's 166,000 vacant homes. There are multiples of tens of thousands of derelict buildings. You see them walk around Cork. Yeah. Everyone sees them across the country. I would take radical action, like they're doing in Barcelona, where you are go to the property owner and say we're giving you six months to use this or you lose it and that's mm. essentially it that's you know? a fair point sure not main <clears throat> street the buildings are falling down yeah, yeah. then there was compulsory what they called compulsory Com- purchase order on yeah. a couple of them yeah but like they had to be falling down they were literally being held up by sticks yeah. and the yeah. timmy and the mall buildings definitely but there's i think there's actually a bigger problem still even you you mentioned all these areas i think where's your Where's your ideas around maybe giving the power back to the actual corporations and the councils building the houses directly for the people? Yes. And bringing in developers to build houses, maybe not the, to sell houses. What about and the council as a developer? That's what I'm saying. But they'll still have to procure developers in to build the houses for them mm. and pay them. But what's happening at the moment is they're giving, they're, they're saying, yeah, we you can have this land. Right, we want twenty percent of the houses for social housing. Mm. That's it, gems, you know, and and there's a grand, you know. So you have eighty percent private, twenty percent social housing. What we need is hundred percent social housing, or fifty fifty even, you know, and that can be even a problem still because a lot of the people that are buying houses privately, they won't move into areas where there's social housing because they believe that they're going to be moving into mm. an area where there might be. Social issues. Exactly. How do you navigate that, Rory? I think that where I would start from is saying you do want to create mixed communities. But there's a lot of people in social housing communities who want to buy their house as well. Mm. So I think new developments should have a mix of but affordable purchase. Not what a lot of the councils have been doing is they've been given the land over to the developer who sells it at market price. So it's not actually affordable for people in the community. Yeah. If you had that housing and I think we do need to go back to the councils been resourced properly so that they can actually develop plans but I do think as well I think we need a national development company that would be a public company Mm -hmm. that would be developing plans with the councils um, for the land and then also commissioning builders not developers but the the small builders in to build and I think it should also be setting up its own wing of construction mm. because um i was listening to your podcast with the construction industry federation yeah that's right and very interesting very interesting and all the talk was about how do we get people into the trades how do we get the apprentices and i'm sc- 
screaming at the podcast, <laughs> as I have been at the TV for a long time and the radio going, why would you enter the construction industry when it's bogus employment, mm. bogus self-employment? There is no, he said, ah, there'll be booms and busts. You're going, why would you encourage anyone to go into it? I well, I tell you something and, and, about... and, I, and I wanted to say is you give permanent contracts. Mm. Yeah. You give you set up a public company like the ESB, a semi-state company that gives the brickies, the the architects, the job security, job yeah. security for life. And they go into it like they go into the guards, like mm. they go be teachers, like they, do you know what I mean? And it's a lifetime job. And then you also say to some builders, you know, we can give you, which is like, we're going to be building housing into perpetuity and we're going to be also need to retrofit, you know, for the environment and climate. You say you've permanent contracts with us. We give you a 20 year contract to come and build for us. You know, that's what you need. And then you'll see people flooding into apprentices because they go, oh, it's a quality job. It's a pensionable job. It's yeah. somewhere where I can see and yeah. I can I can be because at the moment, yeah, it's just it's not. And sure, people are because mm. that was a big thing that changed. And and I <laughs> I was listening to the podcast going, I want to jump on, but I can't. Mm. The, uh, you should get him on. <laughs> I should. <laughs> I should actually. You know, I will. I yeah. will. Um, did, what happened well, after the crash was construction developers and builders stopped hiring um, construction workers, all the trades on, a, on an ongoing basis. And it is all, a lot of it has moved to the subcontracting and the subby stuff mm. and the, the self-employment. And as you were saying, you have a 22 year old electrician going, now you're self-employed. And he's going, what? Yeah. You know, your brain isn't even fully developed when you're 22. Yeah. You know, it's not 24 that your mm -hmm. brain, your brain is completely developed. You're still, a, you know, he's a young adult, and yeah, it's um. So and that's what I think. You know, would be a big thing. We we have the money. They're putting six billion into a rainy day fund. You know, you think you think we have the the infrastructure in this country, the construction inf infrastructure to be able to build the amount of houses that we need at the moment. And my reasons for asking that, as we were speaking about that podcast with um, the CIF, mm. um, man, what was his name again, Jeff? can't remember. Like, at the moment, I think the construction industry, many of its workforce are completely exhausted mm. because there's such a lack of trade um, trades in the industry at the moment and a lot of guys are doing more than one man's job you know they're covering for this and that and the other and it's absolutely exhausted you know i don't even think we have the workforce to be able to but you'd get them in if they were if you were offering them permanent contracts and pensions yeah you change it's not, it never happened it's it's an industry where it's driven by money james it's mm. completely driven by money there's no emphasis on the employees, mm. you know, and and you just said it there. It's all contracts, mm. all these big companies. The only people that work with big construction firms at the moment are professionals. Managers, QSs, engineers, mm. you don't have any of the, the trades anymore. And if you do, it's probably a guy that's with them 20 or 30 years before. Yeah. There's no more. There's, they're not employed anymore. And it's like, but it, it, every industry has gone that way. Every industry, the tech industry, every industry. It's just my, my concern is that are we actually looking for more out of an industry that's already bombarded with anxiety and stress yeah. because but of the amount of pressure? that's where you need the change. Rory's talking yeah. about, I think, like, if an opposition did get yeah. into power and Rory was an advisor and then we brought in, like, a different, a different system where these apprentices would be promised... You know, some of it would be state, a state entity. That's a great idea. And that's the only way you're going to get the, you're going to, you're going to take the pressure off yeah. the existing guy, like guys. You know, where we have our own department within, within um our our, our councils, construction departments that are building houses, like and Irish like Water or, or like you know. Yeah, and and people, <laughs> the slate I get on social media when I'm proposing this, like it's like it, it's obviously worrying some people that this might actually happen because we know, of course, who will who will lose out of it. Um, <laughs> but you're talking about, it's really interesting, the question about capacity, because when we look at our construction uh, workforce, there's about 160 to 170,000 working in construction. Only about 50,000 are in housing. The rest are all building the roads, you know, the ring roundabouts, the hotels, all sorts. So there is something about, you know, like going, why are we building hotels? They should be building homes right now. Do we need more hotels? Do we need more massive offices when there's, you know, 
the we've too many offices. There's, there's more people working from home and stuff. Yeah, so there's a question of the use of the existing, you know, workforce, what it is doing. Um, but ultimately, I do think, you know, it is about saying housing. We have to stop seeing housing as a business. Housing has to be seen like health and education. Do we say, you know, mm, we can't really, you know, give you a education in primary school because... We don't have the teachers. Now, I know it's an issue hiring teachers now. It is yeah, starting, uh, but it's nothing, nothing like, but we don't. We go, we ensure we have enough primary um, education teachers who are employed. We make sure we have enough doctors and nurses. Obviously, there's issues there, but we employ them directly by the state mm. to ensure that at least we've most schools and most hospitals have workers in them. Yeah. In housing, we don't. Oh. It's just left to the market. Well, it's not a right, though, is it? It's not a right. No, it's not a human right. And it has to become a human right. Um, and I think we do need to put it in the Constitution. Um, and we need to think differently. And, and, you know, hopefully there's going to be a referendum on that to put a right to housing in the Constitution. I think it would be amazing if it did happen. It would be a big change. Um, but I do, I, I, like it was interesting, I was up with the students in um, in architecture in UCC up before I came down here. Um, I had spoken to them last year, given them a talk. They'd asked me down to talk to them. Um, and partially as a result of uh, my devious thoughts and uh, the likes of Frank O'Connor and Jude Cherry and their yeah. influencing and work, great work and dereliction. They're actually having a 24 hour, it's a creative protest where they've gone around and they've photographed loads of derelict buildings around Cork and they're developing up designs for how they could be used for housing, for community use, for art, for creches. And they're going to present all those to the council. I said, how brilliant is that? Like, that's mm, the sort of stuff yeah. we haven't seen that. And young people, you know, saying this is the sort of vision we want for our future. And, and even in terms of climate and environment, yeah. you know, the housing where you have infrastructure there is the buildings. That's what you need to use. But, you know, I think there's loads of things we could be doing if we really started thinking about it differently. Mm. Look at the hotel across, remember the old courthouse across from the Opera House gyms Camden, and the key. Camden Cross. Besides yeah. that building there and it's just left idle. It's, yeah. it's idle years now. Yeah. I used to, they used to have arts people in there, you know, creatives were allowed to use the building, but now it's just sitting there idle. But it's just another one yeah. in a long list of buildings yeah. in the city centre that are just yeah. lying there idle. Yeah. yeah. So what's the plan going forward, Rory? We're... For you, even for you going forward, what 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 do you, where do you see yourself in ten years' time? Mm, Let's be I, optimistic, though, about optimistic. it. Optimistic. I don't know where I see him. Ran for the Shannon. I ran for the Shannon. I did. Go again. I might. I might. I'll have to see. Um, at the moment, I'm kind of um, you know, I I'm very happy in in Maynooth, in the university teaching the students. You know, in, in social policy. Um. It, it, they're great students they're a real diverse background um they're students who want to go on and be social workers who want to go on and um do work in policy with with ngos or um do community and youth work or um just yet yeah, work kind of with with um social change and social justice the department i'm in is brilliant department of applied social studies they're really supportive of my kind of public engagement and kind of advocacy around this and the work i do which you know not every university might necessarily be as supportive yeah. because you're supposed to be an academic who stays in their box but yeah, they're yeah, yeah. very supportive of me because they understand that as academics we do need to be part of mm. society and contributing to you know changing ideas and, and and changing policies and changing reality and and yeah. um so i'm very very happy where i am so i you know i'd hope to be developing that and developing the course and hopefully influencing continuing to influence policy and we'll see where it goes um I, you know i think that hopefully in 10 years time the housing crisis will be sorted that's yeah. what i hope i know mm -hmm. you know Isn't that the, the goal like for anybody working like i'm in community work and the, the ethos and community development is you want to make yourself redundant. Yeah, so. yeah. And hopefully we're not talking about these issues. Exactly. Uh, do you know, when when I'm 35 and when Timmy's 55 in 10 years' time. Yeah. But thanks a million for your time, Rory. Yeah, thank you. It was very informative. I enjoyed our conversation today. And yeah. hello to all your listeners on Reboot Republic, because yeah. this will be on that too. Definitely, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Shout out to all my listeners. And it was nice. To, I haven't opened up to them like I did today. So yeah. that's that'll be interesting for them. Yeah. You know, a lot of them are long-time listeners and very yeah. supportive. And it's... Uh, Thank you for being along the journey with me. And, you know, I think it's um, it was great to be here today. I really am a, um, a big admirer of your work and, and I Thank think you. it's fantastic. Um, 
you know, to be bringing a different perspective and your own experiences, your life experiences and all the conversations you're bringing around trauma, mental health, you know, addiction, the humanity that's there and the, the compassion. And I think, you know, we are changing Ireland and we will change. Definitely. Ireland, yeah. Absolutely. So 100 thank you. million percent. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Enjoy your stay in Cork. Will God bless.